I do have to make a correction though. The title of our capstone project is Subacromial Spacer Repairing Irreparable Rotator Cuffs by Restoring the Subacromial Space. Cool. Okay, so what is the motivation of our project? Uh, when elderly people have injuries like rotator cuff tears, it becomes really difficult uh, for them to uh, do their daily activities. Uh, and uh, rotator cuff tears uh, limit the ability of shoulder joint, the mov movement of the uh, shoulder joint. That's why our project aimed to design a subacromial nitinal spacer that will not require frequent maintenance or replacement and can be uh, inserted minimally invasively which will uh, decrease the recovery period for elderly patients. A little bit about the biomedical background and what exactly our medical problem is. Um, here you can see the general structure of the shoulder. These muscles depicted in the image are what are known as the rotator cuff muscles. And when these muscles experience a tear beyond a certain size, that tear is called an irreparable rotator cuff tear. Now, what exactly happens when this tear occurs is that the humeral head, so the ball of the humerus bone, along with the acromion, tend become, um, the, the space between them becomes constricted and they end up moving closer together, limiting the subacromial space. And sometimes this can cause a pathology called the subacromial impingement syndrome. Um, and this type of tear causes a multitude of different issues, some of which are it causes excruciating pain. It makes it difficult for people to go about their daily lives and do their day-to-day -day, day -day tasks. And it also results in shoulder degradation where the muscles can degrade as well as the muscles can erode by rubbing onto each other. So what is the important aspect uh, to discuss is the acromiohumerial interval. It is distance between the acromion uh, and humeral head. So for normal uh, shoulder, it uh, varies between the range of uh, 7 to uh, 40 millimeters, but in case of the uh, supraspinatus tear, it uh, decreased to up to six millimeters. Naturally, this type of problem is not a new one, and there have been many different groups who have tried to combat this issue, one of those being the in-space subacromial balloon spacer. This spacer has proven to be quite effective for a short amount of time, about three to six months, um, it is basically a balloon filled with saline, and it is possible to insert this minimally invasively, which is a very big advantage for elderly patients as it becomes difficult for them to heal from large-scale surgeries. However, this um, spacer has a variety of issues, ranging from the fact that the spacer has a tendency to burst, um, it can burst sometimes and the saline becomes dispersed in the human organism, as well as that it can become dislocated uh, from the, desi from, from the uh, appropriate location in the shoulder uh, because of its slippery surface, as well as uh, the nuisance of having to replace this every so often because um, it's not permanent. And this is quite a big issue because in order to reduce your pain and to help with this issue, you constantly have to go to surgery every three to six months. A little bit about the project history. After the subacromial, the in-space subacromial balloon spacer, another group of people, uh, students from the Boston University, supervised by Dr. Ara Nazarian and Mason Garcia from Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, decided to propose a new method to combat this issue. These are their proposed models, uh, three different spacers, um, which would be made out of a different material, a, sh a shape memory alloy called nitinol. So what are the shape memory alloys? These are the materials ca uh, ca categorized as smart materials as they have the ability to recover th the original shape after uh, going through plastic deformation. Uh, they uh, recover their shape by external stimulus like heat, um, magnetic field, current, and etc. So this is the example of, sh uh, sorry. 
example of um, recovering its original shape by the heat. Uh, shape memory alloys have two main um, specific uh, properties. It's uh, super elastic uh, properties and shape memory effect, as I mentioned. So uh, super elastic uh, properties are that when they undergo large uh, forces, they can reform their original uh, shape uh, after going uh, through elastic deformation uh, up to 8%, and the, they can recover after removing the uh, force. For our specific project, the advantages that these materials propose, especially in the case of nitinol, is that it's considered to be biocompatible. Um, when you're inserting something into the human body, naturally you want to make sure that it isn't toxic and it won't cause further complications. Another big advantage is that this material is also corrosion resistant, so it won't corrode and degrade in the body while it's trying to perform its tasks. Um, temperature dependency is another big one. Why exactly do we need it to be temperature, temp temperature dependent is that we are trying to insert the implant minimally invasively. And this is done by cooling the implant and shrinking it, press compressing it into a smaller object that is known as the introducer, which should be able to fit through a one to two centimeter incision to be able to be placed into the shoulder. And te temperature dependency comes in where uh, we need the implant to be able to revert back to its original shape. Nitinol has different types which can be affected or heat activated at, at or around the natural body temperature of the human body and as well as the mechanical qualities which might have mentioned, which were the shape memory effect and super elastic effect. We are going to discuss our results and... So we had a variety of requirements that were sent to us um, from Beth Israel. Be one being that the implant should be able to um, withstand about 400 newtons of force, which this 400 newtons is basically the amount of force that it takes a grown adult or an elderly person to be able to push onto a surface to stand up or sit back down. Another uh, big thing was that it needed to be as simple as possible in terms of the manufacturing process. And it needed to be able to be manufactured in three different sizes to be able to accommodate for a larger target group and take into consideration the wide variety of anatomical sizes from individual to individual. These are the designs that we proposed. As you can see, they are all tori, but they are quite different from one another. We've given them some arbitrary names. This one we called the um, woven torus, the spring torus, and the hexagonal torus. And these all have a plethora of um, parameters that we can change to alter their uh, characteristics. So. In order to change the uh, parameters, we made models parametric, as uh, we needed to change the uh, outer diameter, uh, pattern density, height of the implant. And uh, okay. it is important to mention that uh, uh, we use binary research method in our experiments to get the optimal va value of these parameters, uh, um, which will correspond the uh, required results uh, and requirements. So we did mesh size optimization analysis, thickness experimentation, and pattern density experimentation. In case of mesh size optimi optimization, we found out that uh, for woven uh, model, when changing the mesh size up to 0 0.25, 7 to 0 0.3 millimeter, it uh, increased the accuracy and also uh, decreased the computational time. And also for hexagon and spring uh, models, uh, we found out that uh, the mesh size should be between 0 0.08 to 0 0.1 millimeter. So this is the our uh, simulation set setup. We did uh, wall compression uh, simulations. So we have two uh, plates, rigid plates, and one is fixed, fully fixed uh, from the bottom, and uh, the upper part is only uh, can displace uh, in y direction. 
we applied 400 Newton force. And for first model, uh, we um, did uh, the main process was this. We choose two different types of densities and uh, choose the interval between 1 to 0 0.5. Just the to make it clear what these pattern repetitions are, um, in our models we have separate units which we have built into a circular pattern, mm -hmm. uh, as is in the case of the woven uh, torus. And we are able to alter the number of these pattern repetitions. And altering this pattern repetition amount also uh, alters the amount of material being used and hence it can change the qualities of each implant. So in, in this case we also reduce the material. Uh, we take, took the I interval between 1 to 0 0.5 in case of uh, 30 patterns and we noticed that the deformation is really small as our requirements uh, is uh, to, uh, for deformation to be between 1 to 2 millimeters and the force should, uh, stress should be um, below uh, 1,000 megapascals to uh, ensure the fully functional implant. Um, after doing binary search, we found out that uh, for 30 patterns and 0 0.5 thickness, the deformation is 0 0.01 millimeter, which is not desired. That's why we decreased the pattern size and did the same uh, procedure for the uh, implant. And in this case we find out that the deformation is 0 0.2 millimeter. Uh, but that is still outside of our yes. desired range. So this is the example of how one mil uh, millimeter diameter and 30 pattern repetition uh, model and as a you can see the uh, stress is really lower and the deformation is not desired too. Uh, this is the results of 0 0.5 diameter and 30 pattern uh, repetitions and the other one is for uh, 20 pattern uh, repetition. As you can see the deformation here occur. For a uh, spring torus, we based on the uh, results we got from woven uh, torus. We did only two uh, experiments with uh, 60 uh, revolutions in this case. So uh, we got 0 0.2 millimeter deformation, which is not if enough in this case too. After decreasing uh, the range, we found out that for <coughs> 0 0.2 millimeter uh, thickness, we got uh, 1.36 uh, millimeter deformation and uh, 500, 600 megapascal uh, stress, and these models correspond the requirements, uh, and it uh, will be fully functional. Okay. Uh, In case of hexagon torus, we change also thickness and also did. Uh, change the uh, unit size. In one case we took 0 0.1 millimeter, so this distance uh, was changed and in the other case uh, we took 0 0.2 millimeters. We, uh, and the result we got is that in case of 0 0.2 millimeters we got uh, nearly 3 millimeter deformation which, uh, which is not also in, uh, in the range of our desired requirements, but in case of 0 0.3 millimeters, we got 1.024. So in a hexagonal uh, torus case, the optimal uh, design which will functionally work uh, was 0 0.3 millimeter design. Uh, these are the forces and corresponding deformation values and the examples of uh, this one is in case of one millimeter and this one is uh, in case of 0 0.2 millimeter design. Okay. This project has had previous results and this project is still going to continue and there is yet to be done a large amount of work. Could you move it? 
we propose four main points to focus on in the future. One being the conceptual design, the manufacturing, post-processing, and testing. For the conceptual design, we have uh, studied these two different kinds of structure, co structures called origami and kirigami structures. They propose a lot of different um, advantages. Two of the main ones being that we are able to change the mechanical properties of the material that we're using based on its structure. Um, we are able to achieve a density, Poisson ratio, stiffness, and impact resistance that does not exist in, in nature. And we are also able to make the models more easily compressible and conformable. And as I mentioned, this is very important for the, minimal, the, minimal and the minimally invasive placement. Um, these are some examples of origami structures being studied now. Um, they are quite porous, and um, these are the types of structures that are very interesting for their mechanical properties. The kirigami structures, this, is, this kind of works like an accordion. Um, we think that this would be one of the best options to look into for the compressibility aspect of the implant. Manufacturing techniques. These implants that we have proposed, we think they're quite challenging to manufacture. Hence, the manufacturing techniques being used should not be um, just the classical uh, methods. Um, we, pr we propose braiding, laser cutting, electrical discharge machining, and laser power powder bed um, fusion. For braiding, they use nylon wires, and they braid it into some kind of structure. It works just as it sounds. Laser cutting, they usually do this either on a block of material or a sheet of material, and then they're able to form it into the desired shape. Electrical discharge machining, in this, car in this case, uh, we have displayed wire electrical discharge machining, where they charge a wire and they use it to cut their material. And what's very interesting about this type of manufacturing is its tolerance. It has a very low tolerance, and I'm sure some of you may have seen those videos where there are those two pieces of metal that are put into each other, and you can't see where the seams are. And this technology is able to achieve that. Laser powder bed fusion um, is very useful in achieving high precision and accuracy for very small parts. How this is done is that um, they lay a powder of the material and some kind of substrate, and then they go over it with a high intensity laser. And the laser bonds those particles together, forming a layer. And so this process is continued iteratively until the desired object is formed. There you can see yeah, sorry. the powder around it. When you push the powder away from it, you're left with the object underneath it. Of course, this isn't um, enough. We also need to go through different post-processing techniques. Those um, post-processing techniques could include, but are not limited to, heat treatments, which um, we discovered a study where they put the implant into an argon environment and were able to homogenize its surface by um, treating it at a temperature 100 degrees Celsius higher than the uh, forming temperature, and as well as um, some coatings, one of them being Gore-Tex. Uh, Gore-Tex is a type of medical Teflon, which is used a lot on um, heart stents especially. So our conclusion was that our this uh, conclusion was that uh, in case of our uh, 0.2 millimeter thickness and with 20 repetition, design was optimal f uh, for func fully functionality of the implant, and uh, that's it. We have a, um, we can show you how exactly this implant will be placed into the shoulder. Um, we took a regular torus and printed it. It's essentially just a donut shape. Um, and this we are able, or should be able, to shrink into a very much smaller um, object. And then through one side, we would use what is known as an introducer, which this in a shrunken form would be able to fit into. And the introducer would bring it in between the acromion and the humeral head. Then this would be put somewhere here, and it would be let go. 
Then, over the course of about 24 hours at the body temperature, this would expand back into its natural shape. So the torus, or the shape that we gave it before, while we were setting it. And this would rest like so here, between the acromion and the humeral head. I'm not sure if you all can see it. Uh, this is where it would reside. If I can show you like this, when we have an IRCT, uh, these bones tend to come together like this, and it causes all of the issues that I mentioned. But placing this in between it would help recover that subacromial space and it would fix all of the issues. So in case of the movement, the implant compress and deforms and when, it, uh, when the shoulder is released, it comes to its original uh, shape. And we would like to thank everyone who has helped us on this project. We really appreciate everyone's advice and feedback and your contribution. And thank you, last but most certainly not least, to our audience and esteemed committee members for your undivided attention. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Mariam. The committee is open to that. Yeah, so I have a, maybe it's a simple question. Uh, the A fundamental assumption you made in the modeling of this is you have like two flat plates mm -hmm. and then the item, the, the, the device uh, undergoing mm -hmm. unidirectional perpendicular force. Mm -hmm. And given that this is a ball and socket joint and given, at least you implied, uh, balloons and other things may slip out uh, I mean, it's it's clear that in reality we have all kinds of joints. There's torque. There's mm -hmm. different. How I mean, have you looked at that sort of assumption and said, okay, in future work we want to look at either yes some different geometry or different forces. It's not just an issue of the geometry. It's also an issue of the surgical implantation process. Once the implant is inserted regardless of what geometry we use, it still has a possibility to slip out of its location. So this would be done by using some sort of staple or some other medical tool to make sure that it is fixed in place and it doesn't move. Okay, uh, even put that aside, I'm just saying the extent to which, you know, how much we get insight from a very simple mm -hmm. model is, is often a good starting point in lots of mm -hmm biomechanical modeling where the whole world is nonlinear, the whole world is not mm -hmm. simple masses and springs and dampers. Mm -hmm. But I'm just sort of curious, specifically for this joint, how much of the repeated, the cyclical loading on this joint actually is compression, as opposed to lots of other, I mean, uh, th this is a ball and socket joint, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the force is going on here and the motions are much more complicated. I'm just sort of curious, has there been any even, maybe we say it's, uh, this is difficult enough to model, let's not add other dimensionality. But I'm just curious, did you ever look into other more complicated models or, or even assuming, okay, we get some insight from this model, we know we're not getting all of the insight mm -hmm. that we might need. At this stage, it's very important for us to see on a linear, I in a linear system, how exactly does this perform? Mm -hmm. um, to understand whether it's even worth it to try. Uh, as you saw, in some cases, our models were either too stiff or not stiff enough, mm -hmm. resulting in either too little deformation or too much. Mm -hmm. um, we took into account that we need some deformation or some compressibility. In this case, we, we tried to keep the compressibility in a range of one to two millimeters. Um, in the case of patients with IRCTs, they are not able to use the full mobility of their shoulder. So to assume that they would be able to raise their arm past a certain level would kind of be useless for our study. And in addition to that, if our, system, if our proposed implant isn't able to constrict enough, it's useless to try it in a more circular environment, like which is like the humeral head in relation to the acromion. For the future, uh, based on our results, we definitely think that it is worth going into um, 
non-linear simulations in that it's not a flat surface and more of a spherical shape. But again, that's for the future. Also, uh, our design has specific size sizes, so it not only has the height which the Bakrama space has, also the uh, outer ra radius depend on the s s uh, shoulder type. So it will vary uh, based on the shoulder size and uh, uh, depending on the size uh, that would also has the effect on uh, simulations too. Because this solution, while it recovers some mobility, we're not able to recover all of the mobility. And so we don't need someone to be able to raise their arm all the way up. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Just a general comment before. Uh, so usually we use the uh, simulations to uh, just test it out and see which wing tan is better working and which one is not so. Mm -hmm. uh, and then afterwards, we need to do cadaveric bone testing mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, this functions uh, in, the pro in, the, in the design way. So mm -hmm. this is just to uh, compare the, these design implants. And uh, that's the way the ASTM guidelines usually uh, tell you to do. So you go through a simulation or an experiment, and then you can do cadaveric bone testing to insert it inside the, that, that like, person's body and see how it functions, and then maybe maybe go to a uh, real life case study. Yeah. Oh, this was. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Sure. One second. Uh, <laughs> I just want to raise the volume on this thing. I can see what I'm doing. I can ask just anything. Yeah, so it's ought to speak and then maybe I'll repeat if it won't. It's not so loud, but go ahead. So uh, this is uh, it's a funny space because you have a shape like this and you have the humeral head that rotates in this space. And the goal is to sort of lift this up so that you have room for the uh, for the for this to so for this to occur. And, and as they were saying, you know, we don't need to recapitulate the entire range of motion. This is basically for populations that they just want to be able to uh, be self-sufficient to so take care of their uh, needs on a daily living. So none of these guys are going to be athletes. They're not going to be overhead motion, much of it, uh, at least on a higher level. But they simply be able to take care of themselves. And the space that we have, while it's not too flat surfaces, it's a very complicated geometry, actually. But this is sort of like the first approach in looking at uh, whether you're able to generate that uh, Sort of the displacement, but it's predominantly a sort of a tensile component that is placed in this process to lift up the space. And uh, but there's other things moving and going on with, with the humeral head sort of rotating and, and, and sort of impinging in that space that you need to be able to sort of adjust it. So there's a lot of work yet left to be done. But this is just the first step to sort of make sure that it passes sort of the smell test and uh, and then the concept that we have is viable enough that could, you know, warrant uh, further work. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, did you uh, make any material, or this is a pure simulation based on the mechanical properties? Any toroids, uh, toruses, or? It's only simulation it, uh, It's based. only simulations at this oh. point in time. But we do think that for future works, it is important to carry out testing. Right. It could be done in vivo or in vitro. Mm -hmm. um, the in vitro option would be to test it on a cadaver, so a dead body, and be able to uh, carry out the an analysis that way. Naturally, we aren't just taking into consideration the mechanical properties. There's also the aspect of biocompatibility and other characteristics. And although the person is dead, the tissue is quite simil similar to that of a live person, and that helps create a more full picture as to how the implant would work in a live patient. Um, in the finite element analysis that you did, or the, you know, in order to look at the deformations, I'm assuming something like that was done. Um, you assumed that the deformations were linear, meaning they would come back. Uh, so the, the the elasticity was linear uh, or nonlinear. Nonlinear. Nitinol is a it's has nonlinear, nonlinear it's characteristics. And it comes back to its original shape regardless of how much force we apply. Uh, it or it depends. Does have plastic deformation that doesn't come back uh, if we exert too much. There force. is a certain point after which it won't come back. back. Uh, of course, there are a lot of stimuli that can help bring it back. Um, but without a stimulus, we need it to deform up to 8%. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there it's arguable. There are some studies that say it's 8%. 
Some studies say that bioethanol can go up to 10%, which is quite a lot compared to other materials. After experiencing that amount of plastic deformation, it's able to go revert back to its original shape. Past that point, it doesn't. Um, but again, that's relative. So in terms of 400 newtons, which was me placing my hand and lifting myself up, when is it 800 newtons or thousand? When when is it that I've damaged it and I can't? You know. We didn't study that. Uh, we were trying to figure out in what range it would. Um, in what range it would correspond to our requirements. The requirements that we at large took into account were that the deformation should have been about one to two millimeters and that the stress at any joint uh, or point of connection in the implant should not surpass 1,000 megapascals. Because um, after 1,000 megapascals, it can, it can failure snap and fail. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that our model does not fail, this was the range that we were more interested in. But I definitely think that it's useful to check uh, the, re the um, reverting back to its original shape process. Also in this case, as we do only compression tests, the shape memory uh, super elastic effect is when the force released, it can revert to its original shape. But in, in this case, we only do the compression test. So we only check whether we have the needed deformation or not. We don't, so basically we don't exactly always reach the super elastic region of nitinol. Some of our testing was done in the elastic region where it hasn't had the chance yet to reach that level of stress. Any further questions from the committee? Uh, I have a couple of comments here. Mm -hmm. First of all, very, very impressed about the uh, depth of your research. Thank you. Uh, I have a comment about, uh, are you aware of a growing medical implant industry in Armenia and some of the companies that are doing also 3D printings, electric laser made things, yes. and mm -hmm. in Armenia and the, well, the working with them could uh, greatly uh, impact your research and uh, create some working examples. Uh, and also, you don't need to um, limit yourself to uh, uniform shapes, but create uh, mm -hmm. complex mm -hmm. patterns that uh, will allow you to avoid slip slippage or uh, create extra adhesivity uh, of the implants the uh, surrounding bone structures, etc. Uh, I would suggest not to stop here on this research, mm -hmm. but go into industry. Okay, there is uh, a lot going on. Uh, especially near, near you, uh, yeah. Arbit Labs, AIP Scientific, and Tech, that will also have uh, industrial base to create working models. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, very well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. No further questions. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you.